Oh, yes, you too. I stole it. Hmm. I stole it. Um, all right, it's it's twelve noon. It's twelve noon, so we're going to begin. Um, Sister Brown. Will you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, I will. Uh, okay, I think we're ready. Preach 
and witness and win souls to Christ. Uh, but I, I want you to put this in your notes because I believe in, in the coming days um, when we, uh, well, even now, but when we get back to church, we're, we're going to be pushing more towards the fact that every believer ought to be a witness. Now, a witness, an eyewitness, is someone who has seen something and is able to tell about what they've seen. That, that's an eyewitness. And if God's been good to you, like I know he has been, uh, it means that you can tell somebody of the goodness of the Lord. You're, you're not telling them something that you don't know. You're not making this up. You are telling them about how good God has been to you. And all of us have testimonies. I, I remember growing up in a church where there was something called testimony service. And uh, persons would stand and, and, and talk about how good God has been to them. And uh, they, they were witness uh, to what the Lord did for them. And, and every believer ought to be a witness. All of us can tell somebody about at least, at least one thing God has done for you. Now we know there are many things that God does for us. And God wants us to talk about it, tell others about him that we might win them to Christ. That, that's the first one. He is too comfortable with these sinners. And because he knew what they were thinking, because they, they were wrong in their thinking, uh, he tried to change their opinion, mind about, to help them understand as to why he hung with who he hung with. All right? So Jesus hung with sinners and We've been through it, and very quickly, let me go through it again. Uh, he talked about the lost sheep, the parable of the lost sheep, how if the shepherd, yet what, which of you, if you had a hundred sheep, you lost one, wouldn't you leave the ninety and nine and go look for the one? Look, the ninety-nine are safe. You don't need to stay and watch over the 90, 99, but the one that's lost is in danger. And because that one is in danger, um, the shepherd's job was to go seek that lost sheep. Now, um, um, when the shepherd would, would go, uh, he was an expert in tracking down sheep. He, he knew about sheep. That was his life's work. He knew about sheep. So he went, left the 90 and the 9, to go find the one that was in danger. Now, sheep, sheep, and really sheep are a picture of us. We are God's sheep. Um, sheep have this terrible habit of uh, wandering away from where they belong. They, they wander, okay? Um, it's not so much, and it can be, that they are enticed to leave uh, but they, they tend to wonder. One of the great hymns of our church says, prone Sorry. One of the great hymns of our church says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to lead the God I love. So sometimes she, they, they wander away. The shepherd went searching for the lost sheep, the sheep that was in danger, because if the sheep was not, if the sheep was not found, it was in danger of losing its life. There were always animals and birds of prey who were looking for sheep that had no protection. And in the day that we live in, in the day that we live in, the, the job of the pastor is to teach and preach the word of the Lord because there are always 
outside influences who would love to steal the sheep from the flock. That shepherd would go look for that sheep when the shepherd found the sheep, and I think sometimes we lose the translation, we lose uh, the picture of it all. Uh, when the shepherd found the sheep, imagine you uh, uh, thinking the worst, all kinds of things running through your mind when it came to that lost sheep. And the shepherd hunting for that sheep, when he found that sheep, put the sheep over his shoulders, went home, notified his friends and neighbors, and said to them, Rejoice with me, for the sheep that was lost now is found. And Jesus ends that parable again with saying, uh, There is joy in heaven. The angels in heaven rejoice over one lost sinner than those to, the, the, to them that need no repentance, okay? That was the first one. We, we talked about the second one, uh, the parable of the lost coin, how the woman had a dowry. It was part of her wedding dowry. She would receive ten coins. And um, I, I, again, I read a coin was worth a day's wage, wage a day's wage, okay? And she lost the one. Now, you know, when you lose something, it, it doesn't matter how many you have. You don't want to lose any, especially something that's this valuable. This meant something to this woman. And the Bible says that when she lost the one coin, she did not just, she wasn't satisfied with the nine she still had. She searched the house. The Bible says, Jesus says, she swept the house until she found what she was looking for. When she found that one lost coin, the Bible says that she notifies her neighbors again and says to them, rejoice with me for the coin that I lost, now I found it. And Jesus again ends this parable by saying, the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that comes to repentance uh, in, uh, rather than the 99 who are not lost, the 99 who are righteous. Uh, so he was telling us in both those parables the value of the sheep, the value of the coin, and thank God today, I believe that if you and I, if I, if you, were the only ones on earth that needed salvation, I believe God loves us so much that he would have come and died for even one of us if he could have saved us um, from eternal damnation. We then talked about uh, the parable of the uh, prodigal son, and we went over that, how the son asked the father to give him the portion that fell to him, and the father did, and how the son left, uh, went to a foreign country. The Bible says that he squandered his, his living. He, he squandered his money on riotous living. It doesn't say what the riotous living is. I guess we can fill in the blanks. What would our riotous living be? Okay, the Bible says that when he had squandered his money on riotous living, now he's broke and now he is in want. He's broke and now he is in want. The Bible says he's in want. He joins himself with a citizen of that, that foreign country and ends up in the pig pen. Ends up in the pig pen. Now, now, some of you may not be able to identify with a pig pen, or maybe, maybe it's been so long since God delivered you from your pig pen, our pig pen. But if you live any long enough, you, you will find yourself in a place where you really don't belong. You know you don't belong there. 
And while you're even there, God's letting you know you don't belong there. This boy did not belong there. He was a Jew. He was a Jew. And the, the Jews, the Bible says, the Jews had no, had no, were supposed to have no kind of uh, 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 touch with pigs. They, they weren't supposed to be near and around pigs at all. This boy found himself in a place where he did not belong. Let, let me say one more thing about that. That's why we ought not ever give up praying for people. I don't care how bad it may be. Um, and I'm talking about our children right now. Don't, don't ever give up on your children. If, if your children are, are safe and doing well, thank God. Praise God for that. If they're gainfully employed and, and if, they, if, they not, if they're not 100% crazy, uh, thank God. Thank God for that. Okay. But, but sometimes our children uh, are in places where we, we would never want them to be. Uh, we would not want them to go. They, it, it, it happens. In the best of families, it happens that children go astray. And when they go astray, we, we ought not ever give up on them. Doesn't the Bible say, uh, uh, train up a child in the way that they should go? For when they are old, they won't depart from it. And there's a lot of truth in that. Well, yes, it's truth there because it's the word of the Lord. Uh, because even when we, some of us strayed away, some of us who are honest enough uh, to admit that we strayed away, uh, God, thank God, he did not leave us there, but he kept, like the, like the sheep, he kept looking for us. Uh, like the lost coin, God swept the house. He swept wherever we were, and he kept right on searching for us. And this boy found himself in a pig pen, and the Bible says that now he is so hungry that he's eating with the pigs. He's eating with the pigs ate. That, that's real low. But thank the Lord. While the boy was in that pig pen, and, and the verse is, he, he, came, he came to himself. He came to himself. Thank God. He came to himself. Now, now maybe now he's looking at his condition, and he's remembering how it was when he was with his father, whatever the case may be. While he was in that pig pen, he came to himself. Um, and uh, there, is, there is some truth to the fact that every now and then, before people come to themselves, they have to hit rock bottom. You just don't know where the bottom is for some people. Everybody, everybody's bottom is different. And sometimes... Unfortunately, you have to let people hit rock bottom. They have to find God for themselves. And sometimes they find God after they have hit rock bottom. The Bible says he came to himself. He began to, 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 to rehearse speeches about going back home, what he would say when he went back home. Father, I, I, I am not worthy to be your son. Make me as a hired servant. All of that is in 1525, I mean 1511 through 24 is where I am. I'm just talking you through it uh, just the same time. St. Luke 15, 11, 24 is where we are with the prodigal son. Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me as a hired servant. And with that, the boy started going back home. One of the lovely pictures about this is that when the boy was afar off, when he was afar off, the father saw him. The father saw him. And the father ran to him. And I understand 
that, that in that culture, uh, fathers did not run. It was, it was uncouth to run. It was out of the norm to run. It was not normal to run. But the father, when he saw his son, when he saw his son, he ran to his son, hugged his son, kissed him on his neck. And the word for kiss there, actually the word for kiss there is the same word that uh, the Bible uses when Judas kissed Jesus to betray him. When Judas kissed Jesus to betray him, Judas smothered Jesus with kisses. It was affection shown to Jesus. And it's the same word that's used here. He, he kissed him, smothered, smothered him with kisses. Okay, smothered him with kisses. And the Bible says that the father uh, brought the boy back home. The boy says to him again, Father, I have sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. Uh, but the father didn't even acknowledge that. Look at the joy that the father had. Look at the joy that the father showed because his son is back home again. Didn't even entertain that. Didn't even, uh, that the boy had to be smelly. The boy had to have been stinking. Uh, but the father was able to look past all of the smell. He looked past all of the stink. He looked past all of that. The disrespect with the boy when he even asked him to give him the portion that falls to him. He, he let all of that go. And the Bible says that when the father welcomed the boy home, look at what the father does. The, the father says to him, the father says to him, Kill, kill the fatted calf. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's have a party. Because my son, who was dead, is now alive. Look at the language there. When the boy left the father, he was considered dead. When he came back to the father, he was considered alive. And we all are understand that away from God we did. Away from God. And if we have loved ones and friends and relatives who are away from God, they, they are dead in trespasses and, and in their sins. And if they don't accept the Lord as their Savior, eternal damnation is where they're headed. But the Father, through this party, kill, let's kill the fatted calf. We've been, we've been fattening up this calf. Let's kill the fatted calf and let's have a party to welcome my son home again. The Bible says that the Father threw the party, but before he even did that, he put a robe. He put a robe on the boy. The robe, the robe stood for royalty. The robe stood for royalty. Put a ring on his finger. The ring stood for authority. There is such thing called, called, they had signet rings. They had rings that had certain uh, 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 signs on the rings, certain indentations on the ring. Uh, and the ring, whenever they would sign a document, they would hit that document with their ring, meaning that the father gave back uh, the boy back his authority, and then he put he put shoes on his feet, signifying that the boy was no longer a slave. Only slaves didn't wear, wear shoes. Slaves were shoeless, but the father put a robe on, a ring on shoes on and threw a party on the boy's behalf because the father says this my son was dead and now he is alive and the father was rejoicing because his son 
came back home and is alive. Now, I, I, I may get to it today, but today I want to go a step further in this chapter of the God, St. Luke 15, 25 to 32, okay? Uh, St. Luke 15, 25 to 32. St. Luke 15, 25 to 32. This parable ends a series, ends this series of parables, and it's it talks about the older brother, okay? It talks about the older brother, and we want to look at that, and if we have time, then we'll go into the beginning of the Old Testament book of Exodus, okay? Remember that we that, that I made the point that many times we make the hero in the story the son. We are so glad the son came to himself and came back home. The reality is that the hero in the story is the father. The father is the hero. We look at not so much the behavior of the son, but we look at the behavior of the father. He's the hero in this story, all right? Uh, but now we see that while the father uh, uh, is throwing this party, <laughs> Lord help, throwing this party, the elder brother is in the field, okay? Now, the elder brother stands for, and, 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 and uh, well, this is going to get a little tight, but the elder brother stands for the one that stayed home but still, something's wrong with it. He didn't go anywhere, but he still has his own problems. Okay? Well, to put it in today's language, you have, you have the church. And the church's job is to evangelize, is to witness, and to win souls, and to make disciples. That's the job of the church, is to do all those things. Okay? to make disciples, to, to teach and to preach the word of God, okay? And you have those who are in the church and they've been in the church a long time. They haven't gone anywhere. They've been in the church a long time. You have those who leave the church, okay? They leave the church for whatever reason, okay? But then you have some who are in the church but they, they still have issues. And, and that ought to teach us that just because you are in the church, just because you are a member of the church, doesn't mean you don't have issues. And sometimes we have issues with each other. You in church. Preaching, teaching, choir, usher, steward, trustee, missionary. In the church, you ain't gone nowhere. But it doesn't mean you don't have some issues. Sometimes trouble doesn't come out, doesn't come from outside the church. Sometimes trouble happens inside the church. That represents the older brother, the elder brother, okay? The, 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 the Bible says that the elder brother, who, who hadn't gone anywhere, hadn't disrespected his father, stayed home, was working in the field, who, who, still, who still received two-thirds of his father's inheritance. The Bible says the elder brother heard the music Heard the music. And one commentary says that he, he heard it wasn't just any old kind of music. It was it was it was like a choir singing. It was it was good her harmonic music. And the boy heard the music and he and he comes to the house. And when he sees what's going on, he asks one of the servants, 
What's going on? He asked the servant, what's going on? And the servant said, tells him, well, your father is throwing a party, is throwing a celebration because of your brother. And the Bible says that when the boy heard the music and heard why the music was going on, and when he heard that uh, his father threw a celebration, a party for his brother, his brother, it was his brother, he got mad because the father threw a celebration for his brother. Instead of being happy and going in to rejoice with everybody else, he stayed outside, sulking, and said, I ain't going in there. It ain't right. It ain't fair. I ain't going in there. I ain't, I ain't been nowhere. He ain't throw no, listen to him, he ain't throw no party for me. And I've been a good son. And what he didn't really realize that he wasn't being a good son here. There, there was, there was a, a, a show, a program. It's back on actually, but a long time ago. I remember it. I was, I was really young. There was a show uh, called To Tell the Truth. And on this show, you would have three persons who would come in. Uh, the, the host would read a little background information about them, and then they would sit down, and there were some panelists who would then ask them questions, trying to get to the one who was the real person. For instance, um, I would come in, and I would say, I'm Morris Redden, and then two others would say, I'm Morris Redden. So you would have acting like they were Morris Redden, but through the questions, you would try to get to which one was the real Morris Red. And the show was entitled To Tell the Truth. And um, I heard a sermon a long time ago, Evangelist Jackie McCullough. I heard this sermon, she preached this sermon. And the sermon was entitled, Will the Real Prodigal Son Please stand up. Because on the show, after the panelists had asked all their questions, the host would finally say, will the real Morris Redden please stand up? And today the question is, will the real prodigal son please stand up? We call the boy that left a prodigal son. But maybe two there was a prodigal son who hadn't gone anywhere, who stayed in the house, worked in the field, still received two-thirds of his father in his father's inheritance. In a lot of ways, he is a prodigal son. When the boy would not go in, look at the father. And again, with the story of the prodigal son, the, 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 the young son isn't the hero, and this boy, sure enough, ain't no hero. And when he would not go in, the father, the father came out to him. Came out to him. Asked him, what's wrong? <laughs> and he said, well, well when, when this boy of yours, when, when he comes home, you throw him a party. You never threw me a party. I ain't been nowhere. I ain't done nothing. You never threw me a party. And, and the father, again, begins to reason with him. And he says to the boy, all I have is yours. You have no reason to be upset. But this is your brother. And you should be glad that your brother is home. He was dead, but now he's found. And this 
points to the fact that you can be in the church and still be a prodigal son or daughter. We need to be careful. My pastor would say, I think Mahalia Jackson would say, you better mind how you walk on the cross. Foot might slip. Soul get lost. We have to be careful how we treat one another. Again, the father was all about healing the relationships with his sons. And we see with the father, we see with the father unlimited, unlimited forgiveness. Unlimited forgiveness. He could have, he could have pushed the, the youngest son away. He could have pushed this elder son away. But he, he wanted to mend the fence with them both. And in closing out these parables, in closing this out, I, I want us, I want us, New St. John, I want us, uh, our, our visiting members, I want us always about unlimited forgiveness. No, we may not like everything each other will do. No, we might not always agree with everything that goes on. But it should never be that here we are serving the same God, praising the same God, praying to the same God, singing to the same God, reading scripture about the same God and not, and not have in us unlimited forgiveness. Amen. I pray today, I pray today that we would see ourselves, whether you are the younger son or the elder brother, I, I pray today that we would, we would see ourselves, all right? Today we want to begin with the time we have left. We want to, and if you would turn to uh, the old book of Exodus and when I was going through this, talking about um, uh, disobedience and rebellion and God's response to it all, uh, we see in Exodus uh, rebellion, we see God's blessing, we see rebellion, we see how God forgave. Uh, but today we want to begin in Exodus and we're just going to go through certain different stories about uh, how God dealt with certain situations, okay? Exodus, uh, I believe the first chapter, we, we, we look at the fact that, and some may ask, how did Israel get into Egypt? How did Israel get into Egypt? Well, we know how they got into Egypt. We know that they got there because of the dreamer by the name of Joseph. We know that his brothers did not like him and they sold him into Egyptian slavery. And that's how uh, he ended up in Egypt. The Bible says that Joseph was, he was a dreamer. He could, he could in, interpret dreams. Okay, he had dreams and he could interpret dreams. All right. Now, now I believe that, that sometimes God speaks to us in dreams. I don't believe that it's all the time. I believe that there are certain times, however, uh, that God will speak to you in a dream. All right. Now, some dreams, some dreams. Uh, you need to just forget about them, especially nightmares, okay? Because, because he, here's the point to that. God isn't trying to terrorize his children. God, God is not trying to terrorize you. He, he's not trying to scare you and put fear in you. 
Dreams are often about how God is going to edify you, how God is going to bless you, what God's going to do in your life. If they come to terrorize you, that dream was not from God. And, and let's not forget that sometimes we have certain dreams and, you know, the old folks tend to think it to be true, that sometimes uh, we have dreams because we ate the wrong thing. And we went to bed after we ate the wrong thing. And it tend to cause us to have some crazy kind of dreams. All right? But Joseph was a dreamer. And because he had these dreams, and because he told his brothers these dreams, they hated him. And the Bible says they could not speak peaceably with him. And because they did not like him, they came up with a plan to get rid of him. They wanted him gone. And uh, if that were not bad enough, the fact that he was a dreamer and, and, and really had dreamt that one day he would rule over them. That's what really made them mad. That was the dream that really stuck in their crawl, okay? And not only was he a dreamer, then his father gives him a coat of many colors. His father gives him a coat of many colors. All right? Now, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that had to make the other boys mad as well. I, I, I believe that they absolutely could have been jealous because none of them received coats, but Joseph was the one who received the coat of many colors. And the Bible says because of his dreams, because of that coat, the Bible lets us know that the brothers did not like him and decided they were going to get rid of him. One day when the brothers were in the field and the father sends Joseph out, the boys see him coming and they devise a plan. And the plan is... First, they were going to kill him. That, that was the first plan. They were going to kill him. They decide not, they, well, they were persuaded not to kill him. Read the chapter. Uh, they were persuaded not to kill him, but they said, well, we're going to strip him of that. We're going to strip him of that coat. We're going to, and we're going to put him in a pit. We're going to put some animal blood on the coat. We're going to put some animal blood on the coat. And we're going to go home and tell daddy he's dead. The Bible says, however, they see a caravan coming. And they sell Joseph to the caravan. And Joseph ends up in Egypt. The Bible says that while he's in Egypt, now he's in a man named Potiphar's house. He's a servant in, it, in Potiphar's house. And listen to what the Bible says about Joseph serving in Potiphar's house. The Bible says that because Joseph was in that house, Potiphar's house was blessed. Joseph blessed Potiphar's house. Just him being there, it was a blessing. God showed Potiphar favor because of Joseph. Potiphar, however, had a wife. And the Bible says that Potiphar's wife <laughs> had eyes for Joseph. And on different occasions, she was trying to entice Joseph to sleep with her. 
And on every occasion, Joseph said, no, I can't do it. I can't do that against my God, and I can't do that because of my master Potiphar. So I cannot do it. The wife was persistent. And one day, she corners, she corners Joseph. She corners him. And the Bible says that when she cornered him, wanting him to sleep with her, Joseph escaped out of the house. And she grabbed, she grabbed his clothes. And Joseph ran out naked. The wife wasn't finished with Joseph. Because now the wife tells her husband, Potiphar, that Joseph tried to rape her. Now that was a lie. That was, there was no truth to that at all. But she told her husband that lie that Joseph tried to rape her and the Bible says that the husband had Joseph put in prison. Joseph now finds himself wrongfully in prison. The Bible says that even in prison, however, Joseph is still gifted. Now, now I, I, I want us to understand that when God blesses us, it doesn't matter where you find yourself. You are still blessed. We are blessed stuck in the house. We are blessed when we go back to church. We are blessed no matter where we find ourselves. I've, I've pastored now in three places. And what matters is not the place. What matters is that God can bless you no matter what the place is. Eastern Shore, Maryland, Charlotte, North Carolina, Virginia Beach, Virginia. God can bless you no matter where you are. And we need always remember that. I, I remember my pastor saying to us, I'll never forget it. We had a ministerial staff meeting, and I, I remember him saying to us, he said, it doesn't matter where you go, no matter where a bishop sends you. It doesn't matter why he sent you there. What matters is that wherever you go, God is with you. And I have found that to be true. That no matter where you go, God can bless you. And that's why it's important not so much to look at other people. Don't, don't look at where other people are. You have to concentrate on your personal relationship with your God. And be satisfied with where God puts you and be satisfied with how God wants to use you. It does not matter where you are. What matters is that God is everywhere at the same time. The Bible says that Joseph is still gifted. He's gifted in prison. He's, he's, telling, he's, he's telling dreams. He's telling the meaning of dreams even in prison. Finally, the Bible says that Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, has a dream. And Joseph is able to tell him the meaning of the dream. What Joseph says to him in short is, well, the dream, the, the interpretation of the dream was, there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And the advice that Joseph gave Pharaoh was priceless. He told Pharaoh that in the times of plenty, store up food so that when the famine comes, it won't catch you off guard. 
you'll be ready for the famine. And because Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and because he gave Pharaoh top-notch advice, the Bible says that Joseph ends up second in command. He ends up second in command of all of Egypt. Now that's something. That, that with all he's been through, now he's in second in command. Hated in his father's house. The Bible says in prison, lied on in prison. Now he's second in command of all of Egypt. You know, we preachers, and I've heard this preached many times, from the pit to the palace. God can take you to the pit, from the pit to the palace. And that's what God did with Joseph. The Bible says that Joseph is in Egypt. He has power in Egypt. And the Bible says that eventually his, he saves his brothers because when his brothers uh, uh, experienced the famine, he was able to come to their brother Joseph. And Joseph was able to save them from the famine. And the Bible says that when they recognized finally that it was Joseph, their brother, who was second in command of Egypt, and they thought, and they thought that Joseph would bear a grudge to the point where he thought that Joseph would, would punish them. They were scared. They thought Joseph had it out for them and that Joseph would get them. Now, now here, here's why forgiveness is important. It's not that people didn't do it to you. It's not that they didn't say it about you. But forgiveness is important because no matter what people do or say, God is still in charge of your life. Don't worry about the bad stuff. Look, bad stuff going to happen in all of our lives. You're going to have some bad things happen. And finally, when they recognized, the brothers recognized it was Joseph, they, they were really scared. But, but listen to what Joseph said to them. What you did, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for my good. That, that's a good note. That's a good note. And I'm going to close on that note. What you did, you did it for evil. But God meant it for my good. Let, 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 let's, let me make a couple of points here. All right? Listen. All of us go through stuff where people did not treat us right. They didn't do us right. All of us. Keep living. If it's never happened to you, just keep living. It's going to happen to you. Okay, where people will do things sometimes on purpose. It wasn't no mistake that they did it. Ain't no mistake that they said it. They meant, they meant to get you. But even with all of that, they can mean it for evil, but because God is in charge, God can turn it around and make it work for your good. As a pastor, as a Christian, there are some things that people did and said that I thought was unfair. I did. I thought hurt my feelings. And I thought at the time I would never get over it. But I've come to learn, and guess what else? I can look back at that and thank God for that. Because if that had not happened, I wouldn't be where I am today. Y'all know one of my favorite scriptures. Is Romans 8 and 28. Romans 8 
and 28. One of my favorite scriptures. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who are called by God according to his purpose. To those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Write that one down, Romans 8, 28. Do a little Bible study on that verse, Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Yes, there are some things I did not like, some things I thought was very unfair. But when I look back at it, I can sure enough really thank God, sincerely thank God. Because if that would not have happened, I would not have been in a better place. So I thank God for, listen to this, this, this is real strange. I thank God for trials. I thank God for tribulations. I thank God for adversity. Because all those things can strengthen us, can make us stronger. Amen. Amen. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, are, there, are there any questions or comments about any part of the lesson? Any questions? Yes, sir. All right. Uh huh. When we talk about uh, jealousy, we're talking about Joseph and his brothers. Yes. And the part of the son that was jealousy. And then the next word uh, was forgiveness. And that's the key word in the whole lecture that you did today for me. Uh huh. Because if we can forgive each other, then God can't forgive us. That's right. That's absolutely and the right. Word is rejoice. Mm hmm. Right. Uh huh. And then come to find out that he's a he's he's the head of one of the head leaders in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egypt was the bread basket that fed everybody. Correct. But God was so far ahead of everybody that God put Joseph in Egypt. Correct. To feed Israel. Absolutely. That's the way I see it. Absolutely. And the key word there is another key word is rejoice. Yes.
you, you all know that uh, Gloria, Sister Redden, uh, uh, we talked about she went to take a test about a month or so ago. And uh, she's decided she's going to have uh, a procedure done um, uh, in, in the next month or so. But next Wednesday, we go to Charlotte. We're driving to Charlotte uh, to uh, have a consultation with the doctor who's going to do the surgery. So I would ask that y'all would pray for us as we travel. Uh, we plan to go up and come back. We're not staying, as far as I know. Uh, but we are going up, we're coming back. But I would ask that you would keep, keep her lifted up in prayer. Keep us lifted up in prayer as we go uh, to see uh, what the doctor is going to say. Let me too thank all of you. I want to thank all of you and please pass the word of that, that pastor and first lady wants to, want to thank all of you for your love and all your kindness that you showed toward us at my one year anniversary and for Mother's Day. Um, Thank you so much how y'all blessed us. Uh, we are just so great. We are really on cloud nine. Um, I don't mind. I, I, told, I, I, I tell my friends when, when my church does stuff like that, I, I tell them what y'all did because I always say if we can talk about the bad stuff, we can talk about the good stuff. So I was able to tell them what, what y'all did for us. And one of my friends was so surprised. Because they said, even in the time that we're going through, they did that. I said, they sure did. So I, I want to thank you from the bottom of our, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts about the, the kindness and the love that you have shown toward us. We are planning an official board meeting. Um, I'm trying to get more information. We're trying to get some information uh, about what we want to talk about. Uh, before we have that meeting. So, so know that one is coming. You'll be notified, email, phone call, in order that we might discuss uh, the business of the church. Thank y'all so much for all of y'all support that you've given me and Sister Redden during this time that we've been here. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all that you have done for us. If all hearts and minds are, uh, bless you too, <laughs> if all hearts and minds are clear. Sister Wilkins? Sister Wilkins? Yes, yes, Could you, could you close us out in prayer, please? Mm-hmm. 
Yes. All of us should have a blessing. Yes. We thank you for your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Y'all have a wonderful day. Have a sweet day in Jesus. Be blessed. Be safe. God bless you. Amen.